Well, welcome everyone uh, to the newest edition of the White Too Long Author Forum. Uh, I am Robbie Jones, uh, host of the Substack uh, White Too Long and author of, uh, well, the book White Too Long um, and The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy, uh, which will be out in two weeks uh, from day in new paperback edition. Uh, but tonight uh, we are talking with uh, my good friend, my colleague, my coworker, um, Melissa Deckman, uh, Dr. Melissa Deckman. Um, I'll give her a, a brief uh, intro. Um, I have known Melissa for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. Um, but well, I think it, it may have been actually um, almost, uh, maybe not quite 20, but uh, 15 at least. Yes. Uh, uh, but Melissa is the author of uh, a number of books, um, most recently the one we're talking about tonight. Uh, do you have a copy there? Because I only have a digital copy. There it is. Um, the Politics of Gen Z, How the Youngest Voters Will Shape Our Democracy, which is out one week from today, but it is available for pre-order right now. Uh, so there are links in the uh, email that went out uh, to, for Bookshop and Amazon. Uh, be sure to click on that and put your order in. Um, Melissa is also uh, the author of two other books, um, uh, Tea Party Women, uh, which is out in 2016, and her first book, School Board Battles, The Christian Right and Local Politics, uh, back in 2024. Uh, uh, now, uh, Melissa is the CEO at PRRI, uh, where I'm the president and founder, but Melissa is the CEO uh, there. Uh, she has been the longtime board chair before she became CEO uh, at PRI. So she and I worked closely together for a very, very long time. Uh, before that, she was the Lewis Goldstein Professor of Public Affairs and chair of the political science department for how long? 22? Well, I was there for 22 years, but yep. I was chair for about a decade. Yeah. Yep. Uh, at Washington College. Uh, so we're thrilled to have her at PRRI, and I'm thrilled to be talking with her about her new book um, uh, uh, tonight, uh, The Politics of Gen Z. So this is all over the headlines, especially with the passing of the torch to Kamala Harris and this kind of huge you know, energy of younger people. Um, and so we're going to jump right in. And what I want to do is talk is just ask you uh, uh, first. Oh, before I do that, I should tell everyone uh, while we're asking the first question, if you could go to the chat and just put your you know first name and where you're checking in from, so people can see uh, where uh, kind of who's with us uh, tonight. And then you can go ahead while we're talking as well and put any questions you want to ask in the Q and A uh, 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 column there, and we will get to that um, about thirty minutes in. Uh, so again, welcome everybody. We're going to jump in though. So Melissa, I want to ask you first about just, I'm always interested in authors, you know, scholars, trajectories, how you get from one project to the other. Um, so you've gone from school board battles to Tea Party Women and Mama Grizzlies uh, to uh, the politics of Gen Z. And I'm just kind of wondering if there's a thread uh, that kind of goes along with those that you might tell us a little bit about just, you know, what yeah, what little veins are you mining and, and threads are you following? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Robbie, for um, hosting me tonight to your Substack. I'm really delighted to be here for this conversation. Uh, he gets enough of me, but he's staying on extra hours to, to have this conversation, so I'm really grateful. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the through line of my research as a political scientist, I've always been interested in what makes uh, what drives people's political behavior. So why do they vote the way they do? Why are they willing to participate in politics? Why do they run for office? Those sorts of things. Um, so I would be what political scientists would call a, a political behavioralist. That's the field that I, that I look in. Um, and really, I've always been interested in how both gender and religion influence Americans' uh, particip participation and their political behavior. Uh, and my first book was on called School Board Battles. It was about the Christian rights involvement in local school board elections. That was based out of my a dissertation in the late 90s that I wrote that. It seems now it's uh, suddenly germane again, given what we've been seeing with yeah. school, school boards happening uh, and the rise of Christian nationalism. But but essentially, I wanted to know why, you know, what kind of an impact was the Christian right having on local school board elections? And it turned out it was a lot more nuanced than people thought. A lot of people thought that, the Christian right was taking over using stealth techniques and all that sort of thing. So I brought a little truth to the discourse there. But I collected all that data on school board candidates and their religion. 
And I said, you know, I have a treasure trove of all this data back in the old survey research days, Robbie, where I'm stuffing envelopes, literally, I had my family stuffing envelopes, I had a 61% response rate, you know, from these school board candidates. So I had collected all the data. And I was like, you know what, let's look at gender. And so that kind of also started me down the path. So I did a series of articles that looked at uh, the influence of gender on school board uh, candidacies, etc. Um, and so I start, I wrote a textbook as well on women in politics for many years because I taught a course on women in politics. All right. This in what? Multiple editions now, right? It's in the fifth edition. Yeah. Something like that, you know? So, um, and that really just grew out of a frustration that there was nothing to teach with when I taught with, uh, women in politics. But I really got hooked on women in the Tea Party because this was an area where I felt like my expertise and interest in gender and religion really sort of combined. As you know, PRI did some really great studies of the Tea Party and found sort of the Venn diagram of Tea Party, conservative, Christian, libertarian was really pretty overlapping, right? It was really a religious movement in a lot of ways. Um, but I was struck by seeing women emerge as leaders in a very conservative movement. And I was also struck as soon as I heard Sarah Palin talk about Mama Grizzlies and the motherhood rhetoric. I was just intrigued with that. And I said, I want to see what's going on here. And what was interesting is that despite the fact that this is a very, was a very conservative movement, and arguably, I always say it's one of the most successful social movements in American political history because the Tea Party became MAGA, which is now the GOP. Um, but, you know, they didn't, the, the Tea Party women that I spoke to, so I went to Tea Party rallies, I used PRI survey data to look at Americans' attitudes. One, Tea Party women, I think, were certainly a minority of of American women. Most American women did not support or does not do continues not to support the policies that the far right espouses. But but you know, the other thing too is that even some of the Tea Party women I talked to would talk about sexism, but kind of brush it under the rug and not see the apparent contradictions of not getting access to leadership in a conservative movement because of their gender, right? That sort of thing. Anyway, so moving ahead, um, I really had no project on my radar. In terms of a solo authored book, I was doing articles and writing the textbook and doing other things. Um, when a survey that you all put out with MTV, I'm not making this up, 2018, uh, that looked at uh, young Americans' attitudes about politics, about racial discrimination, et cetera. And I was really struck in the report that you all put out, and you're looking at 18 to 24 year olds, young women. So this came out in 2018 in the middle of Trump's presidency, were uh, engaging in politics at much higher levels than men and Gen Z men or younger men. And I was like, this is very different because I've long known and long studied how gender is linked to political engagement. And really through the 20th century, women have been far less likely to participate in politics than men. Now in the aughts of the 21st century, American women caught up, but they hadn't surpassed their male counterparts when it comes to running for office. But here with Gen Z, potentially we're seeing a sea change that young women now are engaging more in politics. And so that really started this whole process of the book. So over the course of a couple of years, um, right before I joined PRI, I did a lot of research. I collected my own survey data. I did focus groups of Gen Z Americans across the country, and I did interviews with more than 90 Gen Z political entrepreneurs. And these are young people who have really founded their own youth-led uh, nonprofit organizations. I would also add too, not only was I inspired by the PRI study, but I was also just inspired by looking at young people. I guess as a college professor, interacting with young people all the time, it was really apparent to me that something was happening with Gen Z, whether it was their involvement in climate strikes, whether it was their involvement in March for Our Lives, which uh, that movement to prevent gun violence that really emerged out of uh, the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And then also again with Black Lives Matter, the, re the kind of renewal of that um, in, in 2020 uh, during the pandemic, all these things made me want to talk to those activists as well. So a multi-method approach looking at Gen Z and their engagement. And so that's really what the book is about, the story of Gen Z women who I think by and large are the face of progressive activism uh, when it comes to politics today and looking at young people. Well, that, I was going to bring up the multi-method, uh, you know, research book. Yeah, because you've got piles of survey data, you've got focus groups, and then you have know, ninety something. Yes. Uh, interviews with. Uh, it was a lockdown. I had time to do these over yeah. Zoom, you know, and they had so, time to talk. So. Yeah, so I do think it, one of the things I appreciate about the book is it does give it a lot of texture and and depth. So you can, you know, not you can, you know, you get the thirty thousand foot flyover from the survey data and the kind of measurement and testing that you can do with that quantitative data, but then you also have 
kind of what it feels like, what it sounds like. And so in the spirit of that, um, I was going to ask you, uh, so also just for those of you who haven't seen the book, probably everyone, since it's not technically out yet, um, that you tend to begin, I think most chapters with uh, some interview material, um, right? Where you kind of hear in their own voice um, what they're concerned about, what the priorities are, um, and just how they talk about uh, politics and public life. So I thought I'd just get you to read like maybe one example of that to give us a sense of kind of what you heard and and kind of what their voice, uh, what their voices sound like themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So this comes from the first chapter of, of the book. Um, and so I'm going to introduce you to someone named Katie Etter. So Katie Etter. These are started, real names, right? These are they're real names. Yes. Yep, and yep. With permission. So she did give me a, uh, yep. if you look her and you Google her, you're going to be amazed. She's got her own Wikipedia. She's, she's something else. So uh, Katie Etter started her political organizing days as a fourth grader in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Upset that a teacher required boys and girls to play separately in gym class and noting that the boys had far more fun, Etter organized a sit-in to persuade the instructor to change the rules. She said, we all walked in the class and sat down and after a lot of pleading and some negotiation, our gym teacher teacherly eventually gave in and yeah, we all got to play together. Two years later, after reading former U.S. Vice President Al Gore's and Inconvenient Truth. So clearly Katie is uh, quite <laughs> different than most uh, fifth or sixth graders. She's reading Al Gore's work here. Uh, so of course that chronicles the dangers of global war warning, warming. Uh, Edder worked with school administrators on an environmental pep rally during which she handed out reusable straws, way ahead of the trend, she told me. In high school, she began organizing creative writing workshops for underserved youth, which led to the development of a nonprofit group Kids Tales. Through Kids Tales, older teens led workshop for middle school students with the resulting anthologies later sold online. Flourishing as an increasingly sophisticated political activist toward the end of high school, Edder organized several school walkouts in 2018 to protest gun violence as part of a coordinated national effort known as National School Walkout, which followed the shooting at Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School. Edder's gun violence prevention work snowballed into the creation of 50 miles more in Milwaukee, a youth-led gun violence awareness march modeled after the historic civil rights march in Selma, Alabama. She then connected with leaders from March On, a national nonprofit group of women-led and grassroots organizers that grew out of the historic Women's March in Washington held soon after Donald Trump's inauguration. With the help of March On, Edder founded Future Coalition, which connects progressive youth-led organizations under one umbrella. Edder spent two years full-time as Future Coalition's executive director before enrolling at Stanford in the fall of 2020. Her passion for political organizing is clear as she told me about Future Coalition, which she says acts as a connective tissue between youth activists and organizers and provides resources that traditionally have only been available to adult-led organizing. Um, among other initiatives, Future Coalition provides grant money and in-kind support for new youth-led groups and links nascent groups with political mentors and training through its Future Accelerator program. More than 100 organizations, most of them connected to climate change, civic engagement, gun violence provision or gender equality have participated with Future Coalition, with many relying heavily on social media as a strategy to connect young activists. And this is the last paragraph on here. Edder is truly remarkable in many respects. Relatively few Americans participate in politics so actively, let alone create several successful political organizations that amass thousands of followers online, bring together legions of young people to march in the streets or build coalitions that have real impact on the political process. Edder, who is also part of the LGBT community, is emblematic of the next generation of political activists in the United States who are young, diverse with respect to race, ethnicity, and LGBTQ status, unabashedly progressive, and more often than not, female. Great. Yeah, and it's really remarkable to read like what so many of these people have accomplished in like such like a short amount of time and so early. Yeah, in their lives, like elementary school, middle school, yes, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I, just before we move on, I was wondering, like, what stands out to you is maybe some commonalities across, like, many of these, you know, you've, you've talked to 90-something people. Uh, they're, like, patterns that stood out to you, like, um, you know, across, particularly, I think, among, you, you talk a lot about particularly women and LGBTQ uh, activists within Gen Z. Yeah, so I would say too that I did speak um, 
mainly to women activists, um, Gen Z women activists. I did talk to some men as well. And I tried to cast a wide net ideologically. So I talked to conservative young women. I talked to conservative men and progressive men. I also talked to LGBTQ activists in addition, and then um, some non-binary activists as well. So I tried to get a, a good cross section. The reality though, is that most of the activists I interviewed were women and they were on the left because that's where women are. And we see this also with PRI's data, right? We had a really terrific study that came out earlier this year about the politics of Generation Z. And Gen Z women are, I would ca categorize them as largely fiercely feminist and also liberal and progressive. But I think a commonality among these activists is that among Gen Z women and especially LGBTQ activists is a deep commitment for an inclusive democracy. They care very much about having uh, democracy reflect who they are. Gen Z is the most diverse generation with respect to ethnicity and race. About one in two Zoomers are non-white. They are also um, more likely to identify as LGBTQ than older Americans. Uh, one in four roughly, and about 30% of Gen Z women identify as LGBTQ. Um, they're also a lot less religious, right? And so we see clearly in our data that Gen Z women are not buying what the GOP is selling, right? The GOP, as you know, and you write about all the time, Robbie, is a party that is largely run by older white men who are very religious. And this is not really the profile of Generation Z. Um, and so I think the commonality is a commitment to equality, to fighting for the rights of marginalized groups. Um, and they were really galvanized by Trump's election. That's, I think, something that's very, very important. Um, when I talked to these activists, when I conducted focus groups, it was clear that the election of Trump, who in their minds was someone who was unqualified to be president, but also was misogynistic, was saying, talking about, you know, assaulting women on, on audio tape, all those sorts of things, really for them, what was a wake up call. A few years later into the Trump presidency, of course, you had the Me Too movement, which also really galvanized a lot of young women and raised their consciousness about the extent to which gender equality is still not being met and that sexism still still exists. Um, and so I think all those things together. And then I would add now in more recent years with the Dobbs decision, with attempts by red states to pull back DEI initiatives and to really remove books that talk about gender identity or LGBTQ status, all of these things have really, again, re-energized younger people, especially young women, to become more involved in politics. Yeah, and you know, one of the things we know, right, from kind of well, generations of uh, research in political science is that these formative things tend to be sticky, yes. right, across time. And so even though, you know, they're going to, they'll get older, they'll get married, they'll have kids, they'll, their income will go up. So maybe they get more concerned about taxes. You know, there are those kinds of things that sometimes tend to pull people maybe to the right a little bit. But, you know, we also know that these formative years, whether it's the Vietnam War or, mm -hmm you know, uh, the economic crisis tend to kind of set the dial, right, in a way for a generation. So you can say just a little bit more about that. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, we, we talk about this as the impressionable years in political science, right? So we know that young people, right, in late teens, early adulthood are starting to vote for the first time. So they're really starting to think about politics, I think, in ways pretty concretely. And oftentimes you can predict, and you go back longitudinally, and find how someone first voted in their first election is a good predictor of how they're going to vote even decades later. This doesn't mean, of course, that people don't change their behavior. Absolutely, over time, you see that occasionally. But it's pretty remarkable that once you set in these pretty uh, foundational views about politics, the size of, of government, the, the scope of government, uh, what, what government should be used for, what it shouldn't be used for, it really does have that stickiness, as you talk about. And one other thing, too, I wanted to also bring up a commonality, which I didn't mention before, is it's not just merely that politics and what's happening in current political events was shaping Gen Z women. That was a big part of it. But I think there were larger cultural trends happening that really set the stage that allowed young women to develop really what we call in political science, internal political efficacy. I promise not to use too much jargon, but that's a good one. So efficacy, political efficacy is the idea that you can actually impact change in the political system. And so if you feel like there's no point in getting involved, you're not going to bother. But for young women, we spent the past couple of decades really harnessing their self-esteem. You have groups out there trying to get women more involved in sports. Sports are really important. We find that people that young people that participate in sports are more likely to participate in, in politics. Um, 
you know, you had all these efforts to get girls in STEM programs, right? To kind of encourage women to build, young women to build their self-esteem there. You had organizations like the Girl Scouts really putting more emphasis on civic engagement and getting Girl Scouts to, to learn how to contact their, their local city council person or to testify before a state legislature. Um, all of those things have really built this uh, ability and kind of, I think, given young women the sense that they can make an impact on the political system. And then finally, the other, I think, commonality here is social media. Um, we've talked a lot that Gen Z is the only generation that both con consumes and creates its own news media. They're not watching mainstream media. This is both good and bad, and we can do another podcast on, on social media and the rights and wrongs and all of that. But as a tool for political organizing, it's been very instrumental for Gen Z, especially Gen Z women, because you find people that have your views. But it's not just merely that you're doing hashtag activism. It actually can lead to people learning how to register to vote or learning how to meet up and get a permit to do a rally. All these kinds of tangible things were happening with Gen Z, and they're really poised with those skills, with the self-esteem, as, as well as a political ideology uh, that uh, together has allowed these young women to really uh, participate at higher rates than their male counterparts. Yeah, one thing that jumped out to me, you know, in the book is you're talking about, it, you know, it's not just that uh, Gen Z women have caught Gen Z men in terms of uh, activism uh, and kind of interest in politics, those kinds of things. But there was a measure you had in there about um, what they would consider running for office mm -hmm. uh, that also showed, right, some really interesting uh, data along those lines. Maybe we'll say a little bit more about that. Maybe depressing, actually, because I, I did my own surveys in 2019 and 2022. And I should say, um, I want to shout out to Ignite, which is a nonpartisan uh, organization that builds uh, political capital in young women. So they've trained about 30,000 high school girls and college students to really women to try to, to convince them to run for local office, because it all starts locally, right, to build that political uh, ambition. Um, but they were really interested in knowing what, whether seeing these women in the streets would lead to women being more likely to run for, for office. Um, and so notably uh, in 2019, when we did the survey, the first survey, we found there was no gender difference in terms of running for office. Now you might think, well, that's not really a big finding, but in terms of running for office, we know that women are far less likely still today to run for office. Only one in three elected officials nationally are women. That's an improvement from a decade ago when it was one in four. And when women run, they typically do well, unless they're women running in Republican primaries, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> they tend not to be rewarded by, by uh, many voters. But, but generally speaking, getting women to actually take the step of running has been really, really difficult. So I see it as a win that Gen Z women and Gen Z men have the same attitudes about running for office. The bad news is by 2022, both Gen Z men and women had no interest in running for high, really had yeah. dropped it's like four to 6%, you know, but they're still young, right? And I think that's the thing is they're getting through their lives and figuring it all out. But I do think in fact, the fact that there's no gender difference is actually a, it, it's actually a, a good thing you know, in terms of looking at levels of parity of, of men and run, women running to run for office in the future. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about, you know, it, uh, so first of all, let me just remind everybody, if you have questions, um, we're going to go to that in about 10 minutes. Um, so go ahead and load them up in the Q&A. So we'll have, just click the little Q&A box. Um, I'll check the chat box too, in case the Q&A box is not working, but if you could put it in the Q&A uh, box, that'll be helpful for organizing it. We'll come to those in about 10 minutes. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, so, you know, this, uh, sub, my sub stack is focuses on, on race, right? Race and religion and politics. And, um, thought I'd get you to talk a little bit about the role that, uh, you know, this generation also come of age during the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, and, uh, protests. Oh, and now we have, a, a, I should have done this at the top, a request to define Gen Z. So you can oh. do that on the way to, uh, what are we talking about? Who, who counts? Who doesn't count? Uh, as as Gen Z, I think I'm slightly out of, of the of the category. But um, so who counts <laughs> as Gen Z? And then go to the role that kind of race and particularly this kind of moment of racial reckoning that we've been in in the country and how that's kind of playing out. Yeah. Um, so Generation Z, I should have started with, of course. So demographers tend to look at generational cohorts in about 15 year segments or so. So Generation Z are Americans born between 2000 and after 2006, so 2007 to roughly um, 2012 or so. I think that's about right. Yeah. So 
So essentially now it would be adults who are aged 18 to 26 going on 27 this year. So these are the voting age population, but we still have a couple of years with younger Gen Z, um, uh, Gen Z, uh, I guess, voters to follow. Starting in 2012, uh, those Americans born after that year are going to be reclassified as something we're now calling Generation Alpha, but that might not stick necessarily. So if you look at big breaks in, in American politics in terms of a generational analysis, the silent generation are the most elderly. There aren't a lot of silent generation folks left. The boomers, of course, still a pretty big section of the electorate. Uh, our generation, which is Gen X, uh, that never gets talked about. There should be a book on Gen X. It's just, it's not an easy, but millennials, you know, followed that. But Gen Z is really those Americans born after 2007. Or I'm sorry, 19, I'm sorry, 1996. Sorry, Ugh, it's been a long day. So 1997 to 2012. Yes, that, that's, that's yeah. the group here, so. All right, so Black Lives Matter, uh, racial reckoning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how's that? Yeah, so I mean, I think that was really a really, uh, an important part of, of what really drove Gen Z and Gen Z women to be active, especially Gen Z women of color, but it wasn't just Gen Z women of color. So looking at the prioritization of racial equality, you know, it was really very high among most Gen Z uh, women. Um, also among Gen Z men of color, white Gen Z men may be the least supportive of, of racial equality in some ways, which kind of tracks with what we've seen in our data on Americans, I think more generally in terms of the racial divides there. Uh, but there's really also, I think, a big concern with intersectionality. This is a generation that recognizes that um, you know, it's not just that if you're a Black female, for example, you're dealing with um, prejudice or you're dealing with challenges that are kind of unique to you as being both female and being African-American. And then, of course, on top of that, I talked to a number of uh, Zoomers who were LGBTQ, African-American, and, and, and female as well. So there's a heightened sense, I think, among this generation that um, that marginalized groups are not fully able to participate in society. And so they care about voting rights access. Um, the Black Lives Matter reemergence that of course formed, um, I think in wake of the shooting in Ferguson in Missouri, uh, but really took off in a new way given you know the, the terrible uh, murder of George Floyd. But you had, I think within Gen Z already, lots of young women who were progressive fighting for other things looked at this as an additional, I think, um, injustice to really fight for. Like, I think there's a, a seamless sort of argument among many Zoomers who are progressive seeing that the rights of all of us matter together. And that I think is really important to understanding their, their politics. But there definitely are some interesting, um, even within the progressive community, there's some interesting differences. I have a chapter in the book about feminism. And, you know, feminism itself is often a loaded term, but on um, some of the Gen Z women I spoke with who are women of color refused to say they were feminist because they felt like feminism was a historically white movement, right? It only benefited white women. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's it's really the nuance and differences within Gen Z are really interesting as well to kind of consider. Great. All right, we're gonna do a couple more questions then we're gonna go again to Q&A. So we'll see what, looks like we have a couple of questions loaded up there, go ahead and put those in. Um, so let's talk about Gen Z men. Um, right. So we talked about women and uh, there's a lot of speculation going on out there about like what is what isn't happening with Gen Z men, some kind of uh, really, you know, panicky kinds of things about like, are they all turning Republican? Um, maybe you can help set the record straight uh, for us here tonight. They're not all turning Republican. So I think that's important to say. I think what has really happened and what you can see in the pages of the book and our research here at PRI is that. There is a gender gap happening among young men and young women. Um, but it's not because young men have become reactionary and far more conservative and young women have become far, far more liberal. It's that women have become more liberal, but Gen Z men are sort of reverting to what you might call the mean or average of, of American men more generally. So Gen Z men compared to Gen Z women are just far more ideologically diverse. Um, but in our study from 20, from January of this year, you know, Gen Z men are still more likely to self-identify as liberal versus conservative, right? And so I think that's an important thing to, to, to bear in mind. Again, I get back to the fact that half of Gen Zers are non-white. And for non-white Zoomers, including men, you know, they're very concerned about racial inequality, right? Those are things that really motivate them. And so to say that they've suddenly become very conservative is not necessarily, I think, happening. However, I will say this, 
Uh, I think what we're seeing with the current election in 2024 is that prior to Kamala Harris becoming the nominee for the Democratic Party, there was some polling showing that Trump was making inroads with young men, especially, especially young men of color. And of course, we know as pollsters that um, the African-American community and Latinos, uh, people of color have often been a backbone of the Democratic Party, especially African-Americans. Latinos may be a little bit more up for gabs, but still typically voting uh, for, for Democrats historically. But what has happened with Kamala Harris's nomination is I think the polling is sort of reconfigured and gone back to more normal patterns, right? So a lot of what we were seeing in the polls pollsters are speculating. It was a lot of non-voters basically saying, I'm not going to vote. And so the people that were committed were, were very committed, I think, mainly mainly more to Trump. But again, we're seeing young uh, men of color uh, starting to head back into the, the Democratic, I think, camp as we're, we're going into the election this fall. Um, but I do think one thing that the GOP is doing that is potentially quite smart is they're trying to meet young men where they are. Right. So Trump is going and having interviews with guys like Logan Paul, who's a right wing media influencer. Um, you know, Trump appears at UFC rallies because this is where a lot of young men are being are congregating. Right. And the idea is that if you meet them where they are um, and using, I think, you know, masculine bravado, all of that sort of thing, this this heightened kind of masculinity that's happening on the GOP side, you know, their thinking is that you'll appeal to to uh, young men and on the manosphere, which is a right wing kind of network of bloggers and folks like Andrew Tate, which are espoused in sort of misogynic rhetoric, what kind of unites the manosphere is essentially young men are the victim, they're aggrieved, you see similarities with Trump, right, grievance politics, and it's all women's fault, right, so that's kind of the idea that's happening here, but I think here's the better news, um, and the Democrats have not done a good job of messaging for young men, so that's, that's true too. I think the better news, though, is if you start to look at young men's attitudes about gender roles, we're not necessarily seeing a backtracking. So sure, they might they don't like to be called feminist and maybe, you know, there there is kind of this idea that they think the women's movement has gone too far, not a majority, but some have uh, in the last couple of years. But generally speaking, they're more likely to be comfortable with women in power. They're more likely to think that working women, um, you know, can have a warm relationship with their children. This is a GSS measure we've tracked for decades, right? Gen Z men have become more progressive over time and look very similar to Gen Z women. Um, and I think those are important things to, to kind of keep in mind as we're, we're moving forward. And here's the other thing, too. This is the last thing I'll say here. I have to talk about Harrison Butker, right? The the kicker from the the uh, Kansas City Chiefs got a lot of attention earlier this year at a commencement ceremony where he was telling young women they've been duped, they've been they've been you know misdirected. Career achievement is important. Following your true vocation as mothers and 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 uh, uh, as mothers and homemakers is essentially what you should be doing. And it got a lot of attention, but in reality, our data shows that Gen Z men aren't embracing that vision, that kind of patriarchal religious vision at all. You know, it's it's not really happening. And um, certainly Gen Z women are no thank you to any of that as, as well. So anyway, it's something to watch. I'll be interested to see where Gen Z men land this election cycle. Um, but I suspect that they won't vote for Hama Harris as in high numbers, maybe, uh, as certainly Gen Z women. But I don't think it's because she's um, a female candidate, certainly. I don't think that would be the reason. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to save my last question for the end. We're going to go ahead and turn to um, questions that we've got in the q and I've got one more to come back to you on, though. Okay. Um, uh, so let me go from Tiffany here. Uh, does Gen Z have a less sanitized understanding of American history compared to earlier generations? And does that affect their politics? So, right. So they've certainly been in the middle of the whole library book banning and attacks on critical race theory and uh, AP African American history being taught in curriculum. Uh, you've learned a lot about school uh, curriculum stuff. What's your take on that? Um, do you think they have a less sanitized and uh, view of American history? Have they gotten a, a fuller view of, of kind of the good and the bad? You think, and how does that set their set their dial? I think that's a great observation. I think absolutely. Uh, they, I think, have grown up to look and think more critically about the United States. You know, this is why, of course, you have, I think, um, folks on the far right trying to really control what's happening in curriculum, right? And so whenever there's, I think, arguments that America is not a shining city on a hill or, or is not exceptional, um, all those sorts of things, um, you know, I think the right sort of bristles and they feel like 
you know, the left is not patriotic, that they're too woke, they're trying to malign the United States. But I think Gen Z has kind of gone up and grown up reading about uh, kind of the reality of American history. But we know, Robbie, that our survey data shows that most Americans think that we should be honest about what's happened, right? Yeah. This is not something that's controversial at all. And oh, by the way, even though young people might not be reading textbooks as much, I'm sure they're not, they're reading less, but they're finding out this stuff on social media, right? They're finding memes and they're finding data and information that really is giving them a fuller look at American history. And so I think that that's probably a good observation and striving some of their engagement, certainly. I mean, I can certainly attest just, I mean, this anecdotal, right? It's not data, but, but uh, you know, just looking at my own kids' curriculum compared to the version of American history that I got, I mean, uh, you know, in, in the American history classes here in Maryland, um, they're supplementing even a pretty good, and I, I looked at the textbook, I was like, oh boy, here we go, right? But it was actually a pretty good textbook with a kind of well-rounded, you know, a kind of critical history of the U.S., and they supplemented it actually with uh, uh, the textbook that of an indigenous people's history of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, um, as one of the main editors of that book. And, you know, and that's explicitly indigenous perspective, right, on uh, the founding of the country. I never got anything near that, right, in my public school curriculum. I was learning about Puritans, right, having yeah. having lunch with the the Native Americans, right, <laughs> you know, and, and that right. sort of, I'll give you one anecdote there, actually, that made me think about it. So I, I interviewed the uh, president of Girl Scouts for my book, and she was talking about all these incredible young women doing these projects. And one of the Gold Scout Award projects she talked about was that she had a, a Girl Scout in California who lobbied her uh, school district to have Chicano studies uh, be introduced as a class. So, so I think that's a remarkable um, illustration of just how much Gen Z is hungering to hear about different voices and and thinking about our full history as opposed to what, you know, maybe we were brought up with growing up. So I think it's, I think there's something to be said there. Yep. Well, I got a question from David about economics, um, about uh, says, you think millennials can consider first not to do as well as their parents economically. Uh, Gen Z will follow that trend, I assume. How does not doing as well impact these generations um, in terms of their political engagement and activism? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, when we conducted focus groups this past year for our Gen Z study, I think the thread of commonality on all the groups, and we had Democratic groups, we had Republican groups, we had an LGBT group, we had, um, you know, young Gen Z Zoomers of color, um, and the common theme was really economic anxiety because Gen Z is acutely aware that it's very hard for them to get ahead. Um, we see, of course, now Kamala Harris talking about this housing policy. You know, right. Yeah. Rent, rent and housing. Rent yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, but this is a real concern for Gen Z. Um, and I think that the economic anxiety they have is linked to a lack of confidence in other institutions. We find that Gen Z is far less trusting of the media, of government, of organized religion. So for, for lots of reasons there. Um, but how that filters into their political engagement I don't know. It's a good, it's an open question. Um, we know as political scientists who study political participation that that income and education levels often drive people to be more involved in politics. So maybe it could have a, a depressive effect. Um, but, you know, I do think too, and I talk about this a bit in chapter six, that an attention to income disparity and, and economic inequality um, there's a reason that Bernie Sanders did so well with a lot of young people, because he was talking about having a society that was more economically fair. So in some ways, it could also potentially get them more involved in politics, too. Yeah. Great. All right. One from John. Um, how did the Gen Z participants in your research respond to institutional leaders attempting to squelch difficult topics? So we touched on this a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, did, did that come up a lot right in your interviews? Were people talking about that? Kind well, of making them yeah. angry. Um, that was yeah, so. I did a lot of the interviews in 2020, 2021, and I do think there was sort of this, um, a, sort of an introspective moment among many progressive groups of people talking about, well, we espouse per these values, but what are our own internal organizations doing? It seems to me that that has sort of dissipated a bit, you know, especially in a presidential election year when we look at the stark differences between the two candidates. But um, I don't know, it's something to, to think about. But I mean, again, I just would reiterate that Generation Z is someone is a generation that cares pretty deeply about, you know, inequality on all fronts. And so I think it's something they're very, you know, they, they talk about quite a bit. 
Great. All right. Uh, one from uh, Victoria. Um, oh, yeah. Turnout. Uh, right. The sort of ever present question. Uh, big generation. Uh, but are they do they turn out? Are they going to really the question on everybody's mind is, are they going to turn out uh, in 2024? And, you know, how much difference does it make uh, about? And then the other part of the question is um, about strategies uh, that might be effective in getting kind of getting them out to vote. Yeah, this is a great question. So just to give you a couple of recent examples, in 2018, you had the highest surge of Gen Z voter turnout right. we had in decades. And that was really in direct response to both Trump's election, but also to March for Our Lives, because one of the things that March for Our Lives did was it got people involved in politics, but you go to a march and you learn how to register to vote, right? So there was ripple effects there. Yeah, and that I, was a midterm election. That too. was a midterm election, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but it was only in the 40%. That's the bad news, right? So yeah. high level of record turnout, but, you know, still not nearly as much as older voters because older voters are, you know, they turn out higher numbers, voting is habitual for them. The challenges of getting young people to vote can, can be overwhelming sometimes because they are a transient population. They're moving a lot. You know, every state has a different policy for how you register to vote. And oh, by the way, in some red states, it's been become a lot more difficult to register to vote, right? right. In some ways too. Um, but in 2020, again, you had a historic voter turnout and, and with, with the Biden Trump campaign, um, again, a reflection of the pandemic and what was happening. And I think Black Lives Matter too mattered here. Uh, it was half of eligible Gen Z voters. So half, you know, is still half, but better than it had been previous. It was only 39% when Hillary Clinton, uh, the youth vote turnout, when Hillary Clinton uh, lost to, to Donald Trump. Um, and again, last year in the 2022 midterms, turnout was not quite as high among the youth vote as it had been for, for 2018, but still a pretty high level. And that was really a direct reflection of the Dobbs decision because our data showed, of course, that abortion as a litmus test issue matter to young women. And just to give you a sense of where the gender divide is, if you, I went back and looked at the exit polls in 2022, 72% of Gen Z women voted for the Democratic House ballot. 72%, that is huge. Only 54% of Gen Z men voted for the Democratic House ballot. Because we know that men tend to be likely to vote on the economy more than women. And so I think that was part of, the, we were still dealing with coming out of, um, of the recession with or, you know, the, the, the economic where after effect of, of the pandemic. And so, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think that had Biden been the nominee, we were gonna be looking at some historic low levels of turnout. Our data showed Robbie very consistently that Gen Z did not want either Trump or Joe Biden to be on the ballot because it does take someone, I think, oftentimes to inspire the, the vote. Um, and but with Kamala Harris, we see all kinds of energy and enthusiasm among Gen Z, especially Gen Z women. So, yeah, we'll have to see. We'll, we'll have to see how it pans out. I think it's going to be much better for the Democrats this cycle, given that the change in the the nominee. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see. And whether or not the Trump campaign can make those inroads to to young men in terms of their voter turnout. We'll have to see that as well. But heretofore, Gen Z women vote at higher levels than, than their male counterparts do. That's also something to, to bear in mind. All right, we got one more uh, here from uh, Sheree, hoping I'm saying your name right. Uh, it says, my Gen Z friends are very concerned about Palestine and the U.S. lack of support uh, for Gaza. Now, obviously, your research was prior uh, to, to all of this, uh, but I don't know if you have any anything you want to add about, about that. We'll have some data uh, uh, from PRI coming out uh, in October um, on the, on that very question, and we'll be able to cast some light on that generationally. But um, uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's a really big concern. I think prior to Kamala Harris being the nominee, um, you know, there were a lot of progressive activists who were taking Biden to task for this, and we saw, of course, um, last spring, you saw um, all of these. Um, these protests on college campuses that many young progressive people were very upset about what's happening uh, in the war in, 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 in uh, Palestine and Gaza. Um, whether or not that translate into vote selection in the fall, I'm a little dubious. I've seen other polling showing when you rank the issue with Gaza compared to others, it's always on the, the low end. And even some data suggests to me that some Gen Zers tend to be more, I think, supportive of Israel than of, of uh of the Palestinians. And so I think right now it's gonna be mixed. Um, will the Gaza situation, if it's not resolved, take some of the air out of some of the most progressive voices? Potentially. But I think, you know, in reality, when you think about politics, 
you aren't having just a choice of voting for the Biden Harris now Walls ticket. You're also thinking about who else is you, you're running against, right? And I think, arguably, if there's a Trump administration, this is not necessarily going to help the the Palestinians' cause. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see whether you know. Right now, I think with Harris's speech at the DNC, she tried to thread that needle. Um, if there were to be a ceasefire between now and the election, I think that would help to sort of, for the Democrats at least, help maybe uh, dissipate that as an issue. But it's it's a good question moving forward. Great. All right. We got one from David. A large number of, un there are a large number of uncontested, uncompetitive elections in the U.S. Uh, the primaries end up deciding elections in most of these uh, partisan elections. He says, boomers seem to understand this problem better than the youngest generation is this correct in your perspective? So I guess it's a question about uh, the kind of structural problems, right, uh, that we're facing and, and whether that's like on the radar of uh, the younger generation or not. That's a really good point, David. And, um, you know, just to give you an example, I'm going to go back to the, the, uh, the school board battle book. Really. So when I was doing my analysis of trying to survey school board candidates across the country, um, you know, a third of the, the seats were uncontested. So it wasn't even an election you can study if you're the only person on the ballot. And I would talk to these local election officials being like, we have to beg people to stand for school board office, right? So I don't think anything's that dire, but certainly I think the incentive structure for the major parties and most of our elections, you know, they're, they're really weak. They tend to draw more extreme candidates, particularly on the right, um, because you have primary voters who are more base motivated and more ideological. Um, you know, whether young people kind of catch on to that, if that were the case, you would arguably maybe see on the Democratic side more progressive candidates. Um, and they're still not necessarily, I think, you know, I don't see a surge in those very, very progressive candidates happening. I think we talk about AOC. We didn't mention it here in our talk, but AOC was a galvanizing figure for young mm -hmm. women. Right. Um, but, you know, the squad, for example, two of their folks lost in this last election cycle um, because they were viewed as being too, too uh, liberal and on outspoken on things like Palestine, for example. Uh, and so, you know, whether or not you have younger people entering those primaries, it's often difficult to get them to vote in a general, but to get them to focus in on a primary is often even more difficult. So I don't know. I think you're right in that um, political activists, especially on the right, know the primary structure and are willing to go out and to vote. Um, but you know, whether younger people catch on, we'll, we'll have to see. All right. Well, we don't have any more, but I, I'm going to, I've got my one in my, in my pocket, uh, I'm, but I'm going to ask you one on the way to the one I'm really going to ask you. Um, so it's actually sneaking into, so we haven't talked about religion uh, much. Uh, so, you know, give us a lowdown on what's going on with Gen Z and, and religion. I mean, everybody, you know, we generally know that, you know, young people are less inclined to be connected uh, in at least in formal ways uh, here, but you know, what are the highlights of of uh, what's the highlight reel on what's going on with Gen Z uh, and religion? And then I'm going to ask you about the future, but uh, that one first. Yeah, so there isn't a lot of religion in the book. Um, I do, in fact, if you buy the book and go to the back, you will see my models here. I control for church attendance, right? Because historically, actually, um, women who attend church a lot often would participate more in politics because being involved in church often builds what we call social capital and skills that transfer to politics, but nonetheless. And if for young women, being more religious actually made you less likely to be involved in politics. So that's kind of, I didn't really unpack that a lot in the book, but it's there, that's a finding that's there. Um, but we know, Robbie, in our recent study of Gen Z and looking at religious demography, that Gen Z Americans, about 38% roughly, are not religiously affiliated at all. Um, very similar to millennials. So millennials also are not as likely to be as religiously affiliated. Maybe Gen Z a little bit more, but not by much. One of the things that's really interesting, we did a recent study that asked why people have left religion. And among younger voters and Gen mm. Z, young people and Gen Z, um, you know, almost like I would say over 60% essentially said they left religion because of the way that organized religion treats LGBTQ Americans, right? And remember, my book, I also talk a lot about LGBTQ uh, Zoomers as well, because they are participating at higher rates than their straight counterparts. But again, it's really important to lots of members of Gen Z to, for a fair uh, society that is inclusive of everybody, including people who are LGBTQ. And that issue has really turned some young women especially. And young women are less religious than young men. That's also something that's different. Which is backwards, right, from, yeah, historic. 
Yeah, it's levels. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think in many ways, um, younger women are not finding religion to be appealing because their perception is, and maybe it's a fair perception for some denominations at least, that um, those denominations don't treat LGBTQ people fairly. I mean, the Catholic Church, of course, does not allow gay priests to be ordained. They don't even allow women to be, right? And that's the other thing, right? I think that some of these, um, many religious uh, traditions still don't allow women to be ordained. They take a view of women that's more complementarian, which is this idea that women are sort of less than, according to their reading of, of the of Bible passages. That's not to say that most people of faith aren't supportive of LGBTQ Americans or their rights or even reproductive rights. We know that there's a more nuanced religious picture here. But for young women in particular, I think they've just tuned out of religion because their perceptions are that religion is not supportive of them or their queer friends. You know, And many, again, 30% of Gen Z women themselves identify as queer or LGBTQ. Right. All right. So the last one is about the future. So you do end the book um, kind of talking about uh, the future, as you promised in the title, uh, but you talk about the uh, what you call the possibilities of a more inclusive political future. Maybe I'll let you unpack that a little bit, uh, and that'll be our uh, kind of wrap. Sure. Yeah, I do. I think the thing to take away from this book, hopefully two things. One is that to understand the politics of this generation, you need to understand the gender dimensions. I think gender is a very important uh, lens through which to look at how Gen Z is participating in politics. But the second thing to take away, and the thing that gives me some hope, is that I found in all the Gen Z uh, activists that I spoke with and the focus groups, you know, there is a deep desire to have an America that looks like you know, to have a government that looks like all Americans, right? Um, I wanted to call this book, but my editor wouldn't let me. No more old white guys. I tried very hard. Are you allowed to say that in after. public? <laughs> you, just, you just did, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Uh, it's, 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 it's quoting from uh, many of my, my focus groups, but there's a palpable sense among Sorry, I think I talked over you. Say it again. You wanted to call it what? No more old white men. <laughs> oh, you have a chapter called that, though, right? I have a or, chapter called that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so... Um, you know, but it was really speaking to the frustration by many Gen Z women that the face of political leadership is often still the default are older white guys, older white men. Um, and that is not reflective of their reality, right? They're growing up in more diverse communities. Their friend groups are more diverse. Um, they want to see more women leading. And so I do think that the future is one that I'm optimistic because they're really committed to having, again, government looking like everybody and really realizing that part of government, it should be about safeguarding the rights of all marginalized groups in society. I think that's something that really binds a lot of these young women uh, together. You've talked about sort of, Robbie, in your work about Christian nationalism being the sort of the reactionary response to the growing diversity of America, right? In the last gasp of the far right and trying to use a liberal means. To you know, um, many of the actors I talked with were very aware of those attempts, whether it's restricting their right to vote, trying to talk to remove DI references in, in curriculum. All of these things ring really hollow to their lived experiences. And so I think with this generation, we have a generation that's committed to more inclusivity, to uh, a fairer world, to one that hopefully is, will result in a cleaner planet as well. We didn't really talk about climate, but that's an important part of, of their activism uh, in addition to that. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about what the future holds because I think the values of this generation are really about trying to make a more fair, cleaner and healthier planet. Well, that's a great place to for us to land the plane. Uh, so thanks, Melissa. And I know we're all virtually thanking you for your time and for your work and your scholarship. Uh, so hold the book up again so we can see it. You still have it there? Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. So the politics of Gen Z, how the youngest voters will shape our democracy. Um, it is, again, it uh, drops a week uh, from today, but it is available for pre-order now from everywhere that books are sold. So Melissa, thank you again for your time, for your scholarship, for your work, and for giving us a little bit of hope uh, here at the end. Thank you, Robbie. Thanks for having me tonight. And thank you for all the great questions, everyone. Great. All right. Good night, everybody.